welcome to the Frontline Podcast, brought to you in association with the Atler Group. Atler Group is a collaboration of businesses with a collective history of over 130 years, bringing financial solution to its clients in the world of accountancy, audit, advisory, fiduciary and retirement benefit solutions. Visit atler.im today. On the Frontline Podcast, we chat to leaders in business and successful entrepreneurs to bring you their in-depth and bite-sized opinions that will add value to you and your mind. Uh, Danny, thanks for joining me today. I much appreciate your time. Thank you, Martin. Thanks for having me on. So for our listeners, perhaps a little bit about ground on yourself and uh, perhaps where the first idea around Corn Corner started. Yep, sure. I'll... Um so myself, uh, I'll go back on very briefly on myself. Um, I'm a software developer by trade. Um, spent a few years uh, working in a couple of online industries. Uh, very um, entrepreneurial on the startup side. Wanted to make my own. I built quite a few um, concepts and projects in my own time um, around mm. a few businesses. Was that on Ireland? Off Ireland? Uh, it was in the UK at the time. Okay. Um, so after I'd just finished, come out of uni, um, started working at an online uh, a couple of different online companies, um, online e-commerce, um, but it was basically based around the e-commerce side of things. Um, and then I started building a few projects. Um, started eventually pulled over to the Isle of Man um, back in 2010, I think that was, 11, 2011. What brought you here? Uh, work, so came with one of the companies, uh, came across, relocated, never been here before, literally just turned up on the island, <laughs> started so a job the next day. Yeah. Um, pretty much, um, and stayed here ever since, which has been good. Um, and then uh, once I did, eventually that company got acquired by a big UK player, um, and then eventually I went off and started my own software company. Um, played around with a couple of concepts within there as well. We had a couple of clients. Um, Microsoft's one of the clients and a big UK health company. Um, we then... So that's coding, things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, we worked with... Uh, Microsoft doing a um, project with Toyota, I think it was as well, and it was like a big launch for their, uh, when they were first launching Azure platform uh, and bringing Azure out and trying to drive that. Um, so it was a good experience. Um, but I think we very quickly realized, uh, myself and the co-founder at the time, with the software company, we wanted to be our own boss in some respects or build our own products and not have that um, that client to want to build our own things. Um, that brought us into uh, Bitcoin, and we started mining Bitcoin back in 2012, 13 times. I can't remember, everything blurs these days. Um, so we started mining Bitcoin uh, just in the garage and um, eventually blew the electrics and realized we had to kind of move out of there. Um, we were in an office at the time in Douglas um, with a couple of the shared, uh, shared office space with a couple of the people. Uh, bumped into one of them. He was asking us, he's from the sort of banking finance world and started asking us about Bitcoin. Uh, we said, oh yeah, we're mining it in the garage. And um, we were then got in a conversation uh, and one thing led to another and we eventually co-founded Coin Corner together. Um, so that was a very quick background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, that's fine. <laughs> um, what was your, do you remember your first interaction with, with Bitcoin then? Your first article you read or your first <clears throat> thing that came on there? Mine was actually um, very early. Uh, yeah. So mine was... Um, Your name's not Satoshi. In, it? It's not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, not a real name. <laughs> um, mine was back in 2009. So Bitcoin was released oh, okay, in 2000, yeah. uh, January 2009. Bitcoin was released and um, started operating 3rd of January. Um, in about March, April time, I think it was, I was still at uni at that point. Uh, one of my teachers at the time, she was there, he was um, saying he talked about the uh, Benton Team Generals problem, um, which is a old school computing program, uh, computer problem, and he was saying if you could fix this, you'd be a millionaire and all this side of thing. So I, I'd gone away researching that, and then I came across Bitcoin. Um, so I, I noticed it back then, and that was Bitcoin solves that problem effectively. Um, so I had a little look, uh, didn't really do anything because I didn't really understand it too much. Took that back to the teacher. The teacher said, "Oh no, don't. It'll it'll fade away. That's nothing." So he kind of ignored it and, and dismissed it. Um, so because he was the teacher at the time, I kind of did similar and dismissed it. Um, ignored it, went into the real world, started working, and then probably 2011, it's about 2011, revisited it again, um, downloaded the wallets, played around a little bit, didn't really do too much again. And then obviously 2012, it kept cropping up and the kind of third, fourth time it cropped up, we, we jumped in and started mining. Um, so yeah, it was a, it, I think it's everyone's journey with Bitcoin we find and the more more people we talk to in the industry, they, they hear about it, they don't really pay attention, they 
hear about it again. They kind of pay a little bit more attention, have a little bit of a play, don't really do anything. And then, you know, the third, fourth time, they start getting involved and, and paying attention properly. To, um, to reel through the years, and we'll, we'll go back, but you, you sit here, well, we sit here now, and is there, do you have a certain amount of smugness of looking back? Because I'm sure back in 2012, 2013, you see an opportunity here, and I'd imagine 99% of the people are going, this is like, perhaps the teacher, this is never going to work. Uh, what is this? Um, now I've, nev- is. <laughs> I've never spoke to the teacher since. So. No, no, no. <laughs> not because of well, you that. Must just, a I've lot never, of people kind of. You I've know, not seen him. So. Gonna, and you still uh, get it now. There's still probably a good. I'd actually you know. love to go and talk to him again at some right. point uh, and just see what he's taking. Maybe he's mining in his garage um, somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> he could have been Satoshi for all I know. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, it would have been an uh, interesting conversation with him. Um, but no, I think it's. I guess even when we were mining. Even at that time, you know, we didn't really know what it was still. It was still early. We were still experimenting ourselves. We were still learning. Um, like if I knew now what I knew back then, then I would have been all in, more confident, doing everything I, I could in that space. Um, I guess we saw it as an opportunity, more of, as an entrepreneurial side, that we wanted to build our own business and have our own. So mining was a perfect one. You have no end clients and so on and so on. Um, mining didn't really work for us in the end because the electricity costs on the island just didn't fit. Um, when, excuse me, when we're trying to compete with... China and the US and the likes, it just, it's not, not worth trying. Um, mm. So we pivoted, obviously we wanted to stay in the industry at that point. Um, that was 2014. Um, and we pivoted to building an exchange um, because we wanted to stay in the industry, um, but do something, I guess, that fell back onto our expertise, which was software development and finance backing as well, uh, background as well. Okay. Um, so so that, that leap, well, <clears throat> let's talk about the entrepreneur side first. Do you think for yourself, your co-founder, that's just something in, in built within yourselves that you, you you don't want to be, you know, you want to not be the boss, but you don't want to have someone else telling you where to yeah, pivot and move. I think so. I think it's, I think it's within people a lot of the time just to be an entrepreneur. You don't realize it. I'd never called myself an entrepreneur for years. And I guess only more recently I would class myself as that in some respects. But um, looking back, you realize you were like it when I was, um, you know, go back to your teenage years and you was, I was like 16, 17. I was still building and doing things then. And I remember I used to um, sell a lot of things on eBay back then. And I was shipping things in from China and selling them on eBay okay. at like 16. So um, I then built a, a website called GameStop, uh, which is actually the big American company. I didn't even realize they were a thing at the time. Um, and I built a UK version, GameStop.co.uk at the time, um, and was trying to sell games on there and I was only like 17 at the time I think I was um, so you know I was doing them things but I didn't see myself as an entrepreneur I was just it was I was interested in the tech side of things and computers so I was just doing it and building yeah. it I didn't really think about a bigger picture I was just doing something that I was interested in um, mm-hmm. so I guess that was kind of driven I don't know where that came from and why why you folks like that, like that? Just, you folks just 95 um or? yeah just 95 I guess um mm-hmm. yeah uh, don't run our own just, business or anything so no yeah, um, right. yeah uh, I don't know it's just and I guess it is just naturally in people for that. And I think if you're really, for me, <clears throat> you have to be interested in something you're doing as well. And I think the interest for me as an entrepreneur, it, sometimes it's, I'm massively interested in Bitcoin, don't get me wrong. So that's, that's a big part of, of what I do now. But um, I could be interested in building any business because it's the business aspect, I guess, that in, interests me and in, in trying to build something from scratch to something yeah. of success. So let's those well let's talk about those early days then at Coin Corner the development of the exchange. How I mean that must have been because presumably as you're building things you're coming across problems. It's yeah, <laughs> it's obviously a new industry as it, well. I suppose it still is now really in many ways. But how how did you find those challenges? Hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, it is probably the, one of the hardest. I think everybody, every entrepreneur, eventually says that you know building the company, building the business is the hardest thing you ever do. Um, and it it was like the we went through, you know, we started in a garage and then we was in a warehouse for a little bit and then we eventually got an actual office in, in Douglas. Um, but we went through so many pains that you, you go through, I guess, as an entrepreneur in general anyway, running a business. So that can be like co-founder issues. We can be um, financial issues and, and the, the usual, I guess, that you come across, uh, which we had all of that. Um, we had all them problems and then pain points. It was then really on top of that was this high risk industry that nobody really understood and nobody knew. Um, and that was then we saw the real problems. We had banking issues, <clears throat> we had um, media issues, um, you had uh, customer issues where customers didn't, it's a new technology, they don't understand it, um, but 
people would also come for, come to you. There was, uh, I mean, back in the day, there was a lot of ransoms for, for Bitcoin and things, and um, you'd get customers coming to you, and they're a customer because they're being ransomed for X, Y, and Z, and they're having to pay in Bitcoin. So they don't really want to come and use Bitcoin, and you're just trying to help them out, but they're, you know, it's it's not a nice experience for either party there. Um, and it's just not a nice thing to, to see and have. And they were things that you just didn't, when we first started, you didn't expect and you weren't expect and you weren't prepared for them. Yeah. Um, and yeah, certainly the banking was always an issue. Um, I think very early on, uh, we got ourselves a uh, kind of a bank account um, and we, we struggled at first because we went around to a couple of more mainstream banks and they just said, well, I don't know what you're talking about, no. And they didn't really understand what Bitcoin was, they'd never heard of it. Um, eventually we got one on Ireland and uh, we was able to start servicing our customers. So we launched with that bank account and within three months that news got out to the industry and the whole world knew about UK banking access from the Alaman. And we had a conference here, I don't know if you remember that, Crypto Summit Valley back in 2014, I think that was. Um, and the night before the conference, everybody's flown over. The bank that we were with had, I think, over 100, it was about 110 applications for new bank accounts, for new businesses coming to the island, relocating here. And the night before, uh, the bank rang me up, answered the phone. Uh, I remember being, I was walking around the warehouse at the time um, and answered and he was like, oh, I'm sorry, like the, you know, the, their clearing banks, which was HSBC and Lloyd's at the time. Um, they've said, no, we can't do this anymore. And they pulled the plug on us. So we lost our banking the night before the conference. Wonderful. The conference kicked off and all, all them businesses that had come over for this bank account then were basically like, okay, well, see you later. They um, must have been challenging times when you think about, because <clears throat> I imagine, like you say, the media isn't perhaps talking about it favorably, if that's the right term, the banks are pushing back. There must be times when, again, when you try and drive a business forward that I wouldn't quite say you want to throw the towel in, but you either want to scream from a rooftop yeah. or, or maybe throw the towel in. I presume there's days like that and a lot. nights. Yeah, yeah, definitely. A lot. Um, I think a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of um, times you want to give up, I think, definitely. Um, I think part of that, um, or the way to handle the way, I guess, we've handled that and I've handled that over time, I think, is, is the team around you and the people around you, your, your friends, your family and stuff like that. They can obviously be big supporters of that and help help through them times. Um I think in an industry, it was difficult in particular, I guess, in this industry where people didn't understand it. So you talk to, to friends and family about it, they, might, they don't really know what you're talking about and um, it becomes difficult conversations sometimes. Um, but yeah, there was there was certainly a lot of them times where um, we, even as a business, we were getting to a point where, you know, you were discussing internally, you know, do you do we just shut down and it's, it's like good effort, but we move on. Yeah. Um, or do you keep going? Um, I think we... Uh, especially again f from an entrepreneur perspective I would encourage anybody that wants to do that and run a business and things just just do it just start just jump in try it out and see what happens because you just have no idea until you do it of the things and the problems um, that you come across however be prepared to go through hard times <laughs> um, we spent uh, almost probably the first six months of the business where the co-founders didn't take salaries and there was no things like that you're trying to bootstrap a business from nothing um, we couldn't get investment. It was another major issue from um, a combination of being an Alaman company and being a Bitcoin company where um, traditional VCs, where you'll go and get funding from, um, they were obviously the ones that we were really talking to were UK based. They either didn't want to know because it was Bitcoin and they just weren't interested back in the, back in the day uh, or they... Um, we did get a couple of them interested eventually uh, and unfortunately a couple of them ended up falling through because they realised we were in the Isle of Man and their mm -hmm. criteria of their fund wasn't allowed to invest in a company outside the UK. Uh, so we ended up in this really weird um, criteria of a company where we, we couldn't get funding um, and we, we did eventually uh, take a small amount of funding from a local uh, high net worth. Um, after that, we, that was back in 2015, uh, and then since then we've never took any further funding, so we've kind of grown naturally and mm -hmm. without the uh, the big financial VC backing, uh, mm -hmm. which has been probably even more of a challenge than if we'd have uh, raised the cash yeah, no, absolutely. early on. One of the things, I guess, and you read, again, you read a lot of leadership books and people in business, it's about not being afraid of failure, and I guess that's, uh, you talk there about plowing through problems, etc., that... I suppose you probably, if you look at the journey, there's many failures in there and learning lessons, but there are things yeah. that you will knock you, but you've got to keep plowing through. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I've read a lot. We've talked about this internally uh, recently with terms of leadership and um, that side of things. And one of the things I've learned over the years as well with leadership and, and running not only a business, but looking after staff and team and uh, people around you, everybody's different. And I found, <clears throat> I had read about three or four leadership books recently over the last sort of six months. And uh, they were very interesting where there was a lot of contradictions where they contradict themselves or each other, sorry, should I say, um, in what the way their leadership style is and what you should do as a leader whereas they're all four different completely different industries four different personalities as leaders their teams are completely different and different personalities and there's no one way to do anything and i think that's something that i've certainly learned over the years there is no one way to do uh, to run a business and to, to run to manage a team to run a business in a particular industry you kind of have to um learn on the job and learn on the way there's, there's just there's no cookie cutter way to do yeah, anything yeah. Uh, and everyone's different and everyone, every business is different. If, if there's one of those books that spring out that people should go and read, the uh, one that springs to mind, um, put you on the spot. The one, uh, yeah, that's put me on the spot. <laughs> so I've, I've got them on my phone. I can pull them yeah, up no, on my right. Audible. I say I read books, I listen, listen to Listen, yeah, I'm the same, yeah, I'm an Audible, yeah. Um, I was saying while, while you're looking, uh, I did a podcast just last week with, a, with a, a Stuart and he does leadership courses and I was talking about the book that I always go back to, which is a book by a guy called Jacko Willett, mm-hmm. and he's a Navy SEAL, and he just taught, he's, he learned his leadership through the, being in the Navy SEAL and taking ownership of problems, so if your team's not functioning, ultimately it's your problem, you haven't trained them, you haven't shown them, and uh, when you kind of come to that conclusion, you realise that, and, and most businesses don't finger point nowadays, but ultimately if this, someone's not functioning within the business, you haven't provided the right training, you haven't provided the right infrastructure, and then, mm-hmm. like you say, it's then managing that and everyone's just different, isn't it? You yeah. just, some need a bit of a push along, others need a hand around the shoulder, others just need to be left alone. Yeah, completely. Uh, yeah. It really is that. Um, the Originals was one that I had finished recently, which is very good. Um, and the... Where's it gone? There was the one... Sorry, I'm just flicking through yeah, my, no, my Audible at the minute of the ones uh, to find. How I Built This by Guy Raz as well was okay. uh, certainly an interesting one um, from an entrepreneurial perspective. Um, the CEO next door was another one, um, okay. which was, um, I remember, no, he wasn't the Amazon one. There was an Amazon one as well, which okay. was the Jeff Bezos just reading, um, working backwards, which is an Amazon one as well, okay. which is a couple of the early guys, um, who were early employees at Amazon and were there for 15 plus years. Uh, and there's some interesting conversation and interesting concepts around how they ran their business and how they built it and, and a lot of it, um, how they eventually got to which is nice of them it's, it's really nice to hear back as well i think when you're going into a business you think everything has to be you know 100 percent spot on before you release the products and before you do these things and you hear back to then some of these other guys in the world that have run businesses for decades and they've been so it's super successful um and it's good hearing back to their stories of the very early days um and in the amazon side they do explain a lot of that where you know it wasn't perfect there was a mess they had to adapt and pivot to things and um, the processes they have in place now, the very data-driven company and what they do. But originally, you know, that wasn't the case and they they wanted to go that way, but you have to build it slowly and it, it takes years and years to, to build something of, um, I guess, of substance that's a successful company like Amazon is. Um, I think Amazon, the lesson, there's a lot of lessons to be learned in how Amazon's built. built yeah. and, right. um, the automation from the data-driven side, decision-making, um, the modular aspects where they break they break teams down into small sizes um, and they try and run the whole company as a modular from a modular perspective so you can like kind of pull something out and plug something else back in in terms of a department and it, it still carries on working without affecting other people within the company yeah, um, and it's a really good concept of what they do um, so yeah that's, that's a good one yeah that building's an interesting I was listening to a podcast a couple of weeks ago with uh, being a cyclist with Dave Brailsford on it the guy, the guy who runs Sky or oh, Ineos and he was getting interviewed by, I want to say his name, Steve Ball. I think he's yeah. got a yeah. CEO, CEO diary stories, yeah. yeah. And uh, he was talking about, I suppose, in the cycling perspective, where they've they always talked about marginal gains. And I think I think it's much like that in business, where you can just make these small one percent improvements. So you look at Amazon, you know, twenty years ago, and you make these one percent improvements every day. It seems like nothing every day, but yep. over an extended period of time, you get to it's that. big impacts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah, it really is. So perhaps what we didn't touch on at the start there. Perhaps just give our listeners, if you could, in a paragraph, coin corner and what you do. Obviously, yep. I'm sure most people know, but if you can paraphrase <laughs> it and then yep. we can expand um, out from there. So yeah, coin corner's a Bitcoin exchange. Um, we offer 
uh, allow people to come and buy, individuals to come and buy, sell Bitcoin. Um, you can hold the Bitcoin with us. We've got um, wallets on Android and iOS. Um, the website as well, obviously, is a web wallet. Um, we have uh, some products in there as well, which is cashback. So you can actually do your shopping online and get small amounts of Bitcoin back. Um, we also have the B2B side of the business where we allow businesses to accept Bitcoin, um, whether that be on a website, via email invoices, or in person point of sale devices. Um, is the general. Is it thing. just Bitcoin? Um, yeah, the, the you know most of the products are built just purely around Bitcoin. Um, we do have Ethereum and Litecoin on the platform as well to buy and sell, um, but we focus heavily on Bitcoin. Um, which I'm sure I can, <laughs> might be a controversial uh, opinion um, in some respects, but um, I'm sure we'll, well come on to Expand on why you, why you think that, um, why that <clears throat> decision for your business, you've gone down that route. So Bitcoin for me is the long-term, it has long-term, a realistic long-term uh, use case and sustainability. Um, there's a use case for it. Bitcoin came about, it was separating money from state and it was creating a decentralized currency that um, anybody in the world could participate with. Um, that created the knock-on effects then of all the altcoins that came around and we saw Litecoin, we saw Dogecoin, we saw um, so many others out there that, that came popping up and they're just replicas of Bitcoin and they've made a few tweaks to say, oh, we're better because of X, Y, and Z. They're not better. They just changed a few parameters. Um, it doesn't really technically affect anything. We then saw um, what came about was <clears throat> kind of like your smart contract platforms, which was... Um, Ethereum and the likes, um, Solana's a more recent one and a couple of others. Um, they, That's kind of when we started to get into this territory with the altcoins and the, um, the smart contract platforms. They're all coins effectively or cryptocurrencies. Um, people started speculating on the price and, and the value of these things. And that's where the trading comes in and all the, the Bitcoin exchanges out there started adding multiple coins and lots of different coins. Um, and the way, I guess the high level way I see that eventually is most of them coins, 99% of them, 99.9% of them coins are going to disappear over the next decade or two. Um, we've already seen that happen over the last decade. We've seen coins from 2012 no longer exist or they still exist and they're running, but they're not really doing anything. Um, they've just pretty much died a death. Um, <clears throat> the long, t I guess what most exchanges these days where they're just adding lots of coins, they're going, they're building a business model that is um, trading and speculating, I guess, uh, for the most part starting to be starting to hit the realms of gambling i think for me uh, for the most part mm -hmm. of that um where people are just buying coins they have no idea what that coin does they just heard the butcher down the road say oh this is a great coin getting this we're gonna make millions and and they jump on it and some people make money most people lose money um i think uh, just to expand on that point um etoro uh uk trading platform for mainly stocks stocks and shares uh, they introduced crypto back in 2018, I think it was, or something like that. Um, and they they do release stats every now and then in terms of how many of their customer base actually make money and how many lose money. Mm -hmm. And I think one of theirs on crypto, trading crypto, was like 92% lose money. Mm -hmm. and apes. So it's just, you can clearly see it's a market that is, um, un, it, it's brand new and it's unknown for the most part. Um, and it is speculative it's easy to throw up and create a cryptocurrency and then it's just a case of marketing these things which is what most of them unfortunately are and that you must i mean again someone in that industry and, and focus on bitcoin that must be a, a again i go back to a real uh, pain in the behind because yep. it just brings that negativity of it's speculations etc etc cetera, et cetera, which just makes the challenges you're trying to do in day-to-day -day business hard yeah it is completely we're just touching on what what we were saying there with the other exchanges are throwing them on and they're building a business around speculative investments if you can call it that or gambling um we're trying to build a business on the fact almost on top of the traditional finance sector and we're trying to disrupt the traditional finance sector um with a focus on what that technology is able to do uh, around the world as well not just in the uk um so let's so, talk about disruption then so yeah. and again I, I'm, I'm the bank manager side here going i've created this technology i want to disrupt your industry kind of kind of use you to off ramp from fiat yeah. Yeah. how do those conversations go yeah. <laughs> interesting <laughs> um so yeah i think the, the banks at the minute are slowly i think a lot of the, the staff that work within the banks generally um they'll be customers of ours and they'll be um you know they're they're I don't say believers in Bitcoin or whatever that may be, or they're, they're speculating on the price of other coins as well. So they're all getting involved in some way. Um, publicly, they're not allowed to generally say that, and they end up, you know, trying to go the way that the business is going in terms of um, are they positive, are they pro, or are they uh, against uh, Bitcoin. 
Um, the way, I guess, to look at the, the disruption piece of it for me is when we look back at the blockbuster, the Netflix. Um, that's another good book, actually, the Netflix uh, story um, by one of the co-founders. Um, I forgot what it's called now, but that's, again, a very interesting one. It talks around blockbuster and disrupting the industry, uh, which is very um, uh, some great synergies in terms of our industry and the financial world. Um, you youngsters can look at what blockbuster is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Google it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, so that was kind of like you saw Netflix coming along and Blockbuster didn't keep up with the pace of the way technology was moving and, and what was out there, which was better, which was streaming online. Um, and Netflix took advantage, played, a, played to the advantage of that and took advantage of it and they're where they are today and Blockbuster don't exist. Um, so for me, the financial world at the minute has to do that. Now, I'm not, I'm not just talking about banks. We're talking about the whole financial industry. Um, so Bitcoin has, it disrupts, um, a massive a variety. So let's start. So what I touched on before, what Bitcoin was, was separating money from state. So it's effectively removing the control of money, which everybody knows, say, is, is GBP, US dollar, and so on. It's removing that control away from the government. So the government now no longer controls a a, a money, which is Bitcoin. So, so that's maybe whether you want to answer the question, is governments controlling money a bad thing? Um, that's well. That's one that's constantly up for debate and constantly debated um, between many people. Um, I think uh, there is scenarios where it'll have its pros and its cons, um, but there, I think there is, from a Bitcoin perspective, I know a lot of Bitcoiners believe that's a bad thing and the government having control of anything. Um, I think what we've seen over the last two years since COVID, we saw the financial crash was coming pre-COVID. It was already sort of looking that way. COVID kicked it off a little bit and got the ball rolling. Um, with that crash came um, heavy influx of money being printed from the US, from the UK, from Europe, from, from everywhere in the world, effectively, which was to, um, and you have to appreciate, so they've printed a lot of money. I think the US have printed 60% of their, I think it's 60%, don't quote me on that stat, Google that stat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd say about 60% of their um, money in circulation they've printed in the last two years. Um, which is incredible. That's just ridiculous. Um, hence inflation. And I suppose we go back to printed. It's actually, it's, I mean, it's just numbers in a computer, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Sorry. The yeah, reality yeah. is, it's yeah. just yeah, it's, no, yeah. it's nothing. Yeah. 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 And it's backed by nothing. That's I think that's the other thing to, if you go back and understand the uh, the Nixon situation and and yeah. being gold standard and backed, it's gone now. So I asked the question obviously myself, tongue in cheek, about governments issuing money and because. Uh, the rally is the money's backed by nothing anyway. Yeah. So it, yeah, it has a value promised by a government, a government that's, this isn't an attack on a government, but there are other countries that are trillions of pounds in debt. So yeah. what value that has less or more than a digital currency or an, to me an NFT or anything just, or a piece of art on the wall. Yeah, it's, clearly. it's what, what someone's willing to pay for it ultimately. It is, yeah, value is speculative of what, yeah, it's what someone's willing to pay for. Something is the value of something. Yeah. Um, and you've hit the nail on the head there with the governments and the, um, do you trust the government with the, it's not backed by gold anymore which it used to be and so on there but do you does the public actually trust the government and they don't really i think a lot of it comes back to education and i remember back in schools for myself uh in the uk i don't think we really got taught about money and we didn't we, you know we did numbers and adding things up and pounds and pence check. but yeah um but we didn't get taught money and the economy and how that works so, um, so have you seen the documentary 98 percent owned it's on, not it's on it, YouTube. No. It's quite an old documentary now, ten, five, eight years old, and that talks about the banking system. And it's not about Bitcoin. It's not about crypto. It's just about actually how that's structured. And that's, okay. I only watched that three or four years ago, and it educated me on realizing that ninety-eight percent of the world's money is just debt. Yep. Uh, and how ultimately it's controlled by banks, even not even governments, arguably because the debt's issued by banks. Yep. So uh, yeah, that, I'll have to watch that. I've not yeah, heard that. I've not seen that one. Yeah, yeah definitely recommend. Uh, it it was it blew my mind to be honest. Mm -hmm. That this can't be true. Yeah, but that's how the financial system works. Yeah, I think there's so many good documentaries coming out as well. Netflix have got a few. Dirty Money was another mm -hmm. one, and there's a couple of series on there as well, which is based around sort of money, gold, and how money laundering around HSBC in the past and things like that. It's incredible seeing some of that stuff. Um, but yeah, it's it's do you trust them? People running that financial world, and so yeah, sorry. Going, coming right yeah, back, sorry, sorry, we, yeah. I could talk me, about this sort of topic no, for, for days and days. Yeah. <laughs> um, we need more time. Um, but the, the Bitcoin side um, is disrupting. So with the government perspective, it's separated money from state. Um, it's then disrupting the 
um, central banks as such. So they're, they're, I guess they are the government piece, but it's disrupting the central banks. Uh, it's then disrupting the banks at that level. Um, so it's not only disrupting government, central banks, banks, it's then moving on and disrupting uh, your Western unions, your moneygrams, your, your money transmissions around the world, uh, remis- uh, remittance around the world. Um, it's then disrupting your visas and your MasterCards and the payments infrastructure. It's disrupting uh, your direct debit companies and the Swifts and um, Seppers of the world. It's disrupting all them. It's disrupting subscription-based models like your PayPal's and um, or your um, world pay and your payment protocols out there. It's disrupting everything in terms of the financial industry. That's coming and that's happening. They all know it and that's why they're starting to pay attention. Um, but that takes time you know new technology does take time yeah. it takes that, that time to come in but that's what coin corner we're focusing on um disrupting them industries and creating a better more open i guess um more interoperable products that everybody in the world can interact with and not just the people that visa say okay you can interact with it's for everybody in the world um, we've seen that um i don't know if you see uh, saw the el salvador news from um late last year uh, and el salvador made bitcoin legal tender mm. um and that's been great. And they've been um, first movers, first country in the world to do so. Um, their currency, if people are not aware, their currency was actually <clears throat> um, US dollar. So they just used the US dollar. So they were, in some respects, controlled by the US because they were at the whim of the, the US and their whole monetary system was, was built around that. Um, they also, 70% of their country is unbanked. So they never have bank accounts, which didn't allow them to have access to Visa cards or anything like that. So they were a very cash society. Now, Bitcoin has enabled all of that to change. Uh, I think of the pop- 6.5 million population, I think 5 million now or whatever the number is, have a Bitcoin wallet. So they've effectively banked these people. So previously that's took decades and decades of trying to bank only 30% of the country. All of a sudden, over 80% of the whole country is now banked um, using Bitcoin and is able to now use Bitcoin's infrastructure to go and pay at Starbucks and McDonald's and all yeah, these places. Yeah. And even the small local shops can now accept the Bitcoin payments. That was back when I first sort of came across crypto, maybe in 17, the banking, the unbankable was one of the big sales yeah. pitches really that you'd see yeah. pro, pro Bitcoin is talking about. Yeah, I think that takes time and that is, that's now been shown with El Salvador and it's, it's really happened. That's happened in, in the world in a country of 6.5 million people. Um, it's still a small country, don't get me wrong, but it's still, it's well, medium sized country. Um, but it's happened and it's, it's gave, it's given the El Salvadorians kind of control back a little bit and a bit of power. Um, the US hate it and the US are on the back. Uh, IMF, the, the, um, sort of monetary, f- uh, for them. Yeah, international uh, monetary. Yeah, 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 yeah. The F's called that. Um, so they've, uh, I think just last night, they've um, had a bit of a, a kickoff at El Salvador and they're urging them to reverse the decision and not make Bitcoin legal. Control and power, I assume and that's exactly primarily. That. Although yeah. I assume the label on it is money laundering and it's well, et cetera. Funnily enough, the, the, the statements they put out, they just say it's a risk. And they okay. don't then go in to explain what they think the risks are right. and how that works. It's a risk to them and it's a risk to the U.S. Um, power, effectively. Uh, and I think that's a big part of the U.S. are heavily controlling um, IMF and FATFA and so on. And they're trying to tighten their grips on certain things. And the, we need the likes of El Salvador. It's an opportunity for El Salvadorians to adopt this and, and run with this. Um, they've created something called a Bitcoin bond, which is, again, first in the world, which allows... Um, you can it's a billion dollar bond uh, and you can buy some of this bond and what they're going to do with that billion dollars is they are going to buy 500 million dollars worth of bitcoin and they're going to put 500 million dollars into bitcoin mining hardware and mine okay. um, they've actually it sounds ridiculous all this stuff eventually but they've got a, a, vol, a volcanoes there quite a lot of volcanoes and they have the volcano energy. power so that, mm. yeah so they're actually already mining bitcoin with volcanoes which sounds oh, ridiculous but mm. uh, it works and it's free energy and um, renewable effectively um in some respects um so they're already doing that and they're putting more into that they're building a whole city that they've called now the bitcoin city and they're trying to drive it forwards uh the bitcoin bond should be live in the next couple of months i think um for people to participate and we'll see how how well that plays out um but that again is taking more control away from the us and the us dollar and and that is something that they don't like and the imf don't like yeah i'm sure um it's it's going to be a a good well i guess a (laughs) Um, interesting couple of years, yeah, I think now. Um, so yeah, we're seeing a couple of other countries 
Um, more what you think they do, don't they? <laughs> there's yeah, yeah. There's a lot. Any any hyperinflation side, yeah, yeah, is is desperate for it. The Argentina, the Venezuela, is all them sort of ones. Um, I think Argentina was fifty percent with inflation this year, this last twelve months. It's just ridiculous. Um, so they're all they're all paying attention now. They're all looking. Turkey, I think, is another one um, that is on the radar at the minute. Um, Tonga is a very small country, only sort of size of the population as the Isle of Man. Um, but again, they don't have the same infrastructure that we might have in the Alaman in the UK in, in their world, and they don't have their own central bank and currency. They are adopting it. Um, they hope to get that past September this year, I think, and run that in November late this year. So they'll be going live with it as well. Same playbook, effectively, as El Salvador. Yeah, right. um, so this is now being rolled out and happening across the world. Um, and it will be small countries to start with, and then eventually the larger countries will come around. Yeah.